I'm Christine Lajeunesse, and I'm president and owner of Always Best Care Senior Services of Central Connecticut, located in Manchester. We provide everything from companionship needs, where it could be something as um, simple as meal preparation, medication reminders, transportation, um, tending to the household, and then the care can progress to the point of maybe somebody needing hands-on assistance with bathing, dressing, toileting needs, even to the point of somebody that could be completely bed-bound with a mechanical lift, such as a Hoyer lift or a Sierra lift, um, and for people that have been diagnosed with Parkinson's, dementia, ALS. And so a family wants to make sure that who we are sending in has that level of knowledge and expertise. We provide two different resources to people in the community. One is that we can help families with in-home care. So everything from three consecutive hours all the way up to 24-hour live-in care with a care provider in their home or in an assisted living community, even in skilled nursing or a hospital setting. And then what we also can offer is if somebody is no longer able to stay at home either financially or their home doesn't suit their needs, then we can help them um, complementary to find an independent assisted living or a memory care community that will meet their financial needs but will also make sure to grow with their health care needs. My husband and I founded our agency 10 years ago. And what brought us to it was a variety of things. Going into college, I had hoped to be a registered nurse. And unfortunately, but maybe fortunately for people in the public, I learned early that I was afraid of blood and needles. So that doesn't mix well. But I definitely had a passion in working with our older population. Both my husband and I grew up in Manchester, and we were both raised with grandparents living in our home, and we each had certain experiences in how our families assisted our loved ones with the care that they needed. And so fast forward all these years to 10 years ago, we had a couple of life-changing events in our employment, and we had an opportunity to look at a different career path. And when we explored all the different options. At the same time, we had a um, aunt who had been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. When John and I were faced with this decision, we had thought about a career path in opening a home care agency and applying all of our knowledge um, in caring for our loved ones. And um, the fact of our on having dementia and forming an agency where we could provide services to people in our community and do it from a more personal aspect. There are three different types of, actually there's really four different types of community living for uh, individuals as they age in place. There are what are known as retirement communities or retirement homes. Then you have independent living, assisted living and memory care. But the most crucial thing is that there is no care provided as part of their model. With assisted living and memory care, they actually will do a full care plan assessment. They have nursing staff on site, round the clock. So there's registered nurses during the day, and then there are certified nurses um, throughout the day and overnight to make sure that your loved one's care needs are being met. And so it's really knowing all of those different types of care um, and what is allowed and not allowed that we help in figuring out. For all of the community settings, nine times out of 10, it is going to be private pay. You can refer back to if you have a long-term care policy, your long-term care policy may be able to supplement an assisted living or a memory care community. They are not going to offset the cost of your rent in a senior housing complex or an independent living community. There are a handful of communities throughout the state of Connecticut listed under those four categories that when they were built, their model had to include housing that allowed a Medicare or a Medicaid payment. Often though, those apartments are, you know, snatched up really quickly and the availability is very slim on those. So when somebody has those limited resources, there are a handful of communities out there, but then people may have to explore a long-term care facility or what some people commonly think of as a skilled nursing or a convalescent home. But for our agency, um, we are private pay, but there's also a very little known benefit 
which is available to veterans and spouses of veterans, and that is called aid in attendance. So that benefit is not indicative of the veteran being injured in a service-related injury. The monies are available to the veteran and or spouse of a veteran as long as they have a certain amount of activities of daily living um, that need to be met. And there are some financial restrictions as to what they can have as far as assets. But the nice thing is that you can actually own your home, you can actually own a vehicle, so it's different than when you're spending down for Medicaid or what we often notice, Title 19. So there are different resources out there. Some people will use some of their retirement funds that have been set aside as well, and we can customize care around any budget. People question whether or not staying home is the best option for their family member. They can see that their home, their loved one's home can no longer be modified. Um, maybe they live in some of the older homes that are in the area that are two stories with the narrow stairwells, tight bathrooms, and it really is difficult for them to tend to their loved one's personal care needs, never mind tending to the house. Or even their neighborhood and their social circle has changed with people passing away as we age in place and somebody no longer driving anymore. How can all of that person's needs be met so that they have the quality of life that they deserve as we all get older? And for always best care, we have the in-home care component where if your loved one really wants to stay home and, and we have the care options that can work, that is fine. But then we have the alternative, which is to help a family start navigating through the process of looking at independent assisted living, memory care communities. And what people realize, it's very similar to buying a house. You know, when you bought your house, not every house met your needs. Not every house was the right size. Maybe the makeup of the neighborhood and your neighbors wasn't the right mix for your interests. And Assisted living, independent living, and memory care communities all vary in what types of service they can provide, even what types of equipment that they allow into their building. There are some communities that don't allow Hoyer lifts. Um, they have extra charges for managing oxygen, even if it's just in the building. And their care levels all vary in costs. And it is a big undertaking in trying to figure out what is the best option that can withstand the care needs and the, the monies that you have set aside. So for Always Best Care, we will work with a family, we'll have a, a very intense meeting in discussing somebody's needs and what their financial resources are. And then we will help them in narrowing down the options that are available to them to simply about two or three will accompany them and their loved one out on those tours. We can help them in making sure that they're getting the best price possible within their budget in moving in and really be um, kind of like a companion in walking them through that. So, and while we do not receive a fee from the family, we do get a flat referral fee, but that is only if an individual selects that particular community. And that also means that we are looking at the best interest of our client and not looking at what the most expensive community is. And first and foremost, we always tell our families that our primary concern is making sure that the care needs of their family member or loved one are being met from a personal care standpoint and making sure that their family members are safe as well. But within that, as we age in place, things like emptying a dishwasher and doing laundry and wiping down bathrooms because of mobility can be really difficult. So what light housekeeping and laundry means is that we are not a full cleaning service like your local cleaning company could do. They're gonna be able to do your dishes. They're going to wipe down counters after meal preparation, do some vacuuming and light mopping. When a family wants to know how we look at matching our staff member to their loved one's needs, we are looking at a complete package. We'll go out and we provide a complimentary um, care assessment. And then we also send a full profile questionnaire to the families. And of course, first and foremost, we wanna focus on the individual's care needs at hand, all of their healthcare concerns, whether it's something they're facing as a challenge now or something previously. 
But what families often get caught off guard by is that when we ask questions about their family member in their younger years, when they were maybe working or an active participant in their community, what their family makeup is. And for us, that all plays into the role of selecting the proper caregiver. Because if you think about yourself as a young individual um, and how that you're gonna view yourself 20 or 30 years from now, whatever you've done in your younger life impacts your behavior um, and how you see yourself as you're continuing to age in place. And so it is a whole complete package in order to be able to match somebody. And then we also discuss, you know, what are things that are a complete turnoff for your loved one? For some people, they like a really quiet caregiver that is attentive and can just take charge. Others like to give direction and everything that is done within their home, they want for the care provider to come back and just check with them on how they like that done. Other people like a big personality of a caregiver. So those are all important things that we take into account as well as looking at what the care needs are, but also kind of what the deal breakers are in the personality. On where is the oversight? So often, if you think about a normal work environment, you're coming in and you're working alongside your manager and your coworkers, and everybody sees your interaction and how you perform your job on an everyday basis. And when you're providing home care services into somebody's home, that care provider is going in independently and working one on one with the person's family member or loved one. And for our agency, we like to have an extension from our office right out into the home, not only to provide the support to our client, but also to provide the support to our care provider. So we have a supervisor and she serves in a variety of functions. The first function is that when we begin our services on the very first day of care, she will accompany the caregiver out to the home and make sure that that introduction goes smoothly because nerves are high you're having a brand new person come in, and sometimes you're having them tend to the most personal care needs that anybody has ever done for you that you've been able to do independently. So she wants to make sure that that introduction goes smoothly, that we acclimate and show the caregiver around the home so that they don't spend their entire first day looking for where everything is to um, help our client out and even tend to just the regular household needs. From there, she will do regular home-based visits. So anybody that receives round-the-clock care from our agency, they get a visit every single week. Those visits are unannounced to our caregivers. So when we do that, we're happy to let our family members and our clients know of that visit, but we don't want our actual staff member to know about the visit. From there, she'll actually separate the caregiver and the client and speak privately with each of them to talk a little bit more openly about how each of them feel that the care is going and what the needs are and are they being met. So by separating each person and having that honest conversation, we can address if there's a concern, even if the caregiver is concerned and sees some things that are a repetitive pattern that could maybe be indicative of a urinary tract infection or maybe some dementia progressing along, then we can go back to the family and start strategizing on how to modify the care plan or get them the care that they need um, from a medical professional. At our agency, um, all of my internal staff members have been promoted within. They're all certified nursing assistants, so they've worked in the industry um, as a backup in case we need to send somebody out into the field. But we also have gone through dementia training, which seems to be the primary diagnosis of, I would say, 90% of our clients. So we've done our training through the Alzheimer's Association here in Connecticut, and both myself and my director of operations are certified dementia practitioners. And we focus strongly on being able to train our staff members in dementia care and also we use a company called IPC Ed, which is basically an online schooling tool for our caregivers to complete training. We also have a complete full training room in our office. So we have a Hoyer lift, we have a medical mannequin, hospital bed, wheelchairs, and we can pair up our staff um, when they're first onboarding to assess their actual hands-on skills, but then we can also bring our caregivers in to 
uh, look and help them to retrain on pieces of equipment that maybe they haven't used in quite some time. We recently had a call into our office what qualified as a senior citizen. And I, I told that family member that while that is our primary client, that our youngest client has been 14 years old and our oldest client has been 102 years old. So if there is an individual that has a younger family member um, with a special need or a disability that needs one-on-one -on -one care, we have the qualified staff that can come in and provide those services. If they feel as though the future is not representative of what their wishes are, they really need to contact their local representatives and share their thoughts and opinions to make sure that our most important population that has paved the way for all of us to continue to work is well taken care of. And I think that's our only concern down the road is that sometimes the people that are making decisions in our industry are so far removed from the industry because maybe they haven't imp been impacted personally that they're not hearing or taking into consideration what their decisions might mean for our future generation.